Hello everyone and welcome back to our course, our course on commercial open source startups. My name is Dirk Riele and I'm often co-teaching this course with Dr. Thomas Order of Order Advisory and this slide deck contains contributions by him. We are still in the first part of three of this course talking about the software industry and in this session I will look at how software vendors function. So we need to look at uh, the difference between projects and products and what it means for companies. We'll look at the financial, uh, we'll take a financial perspective because in the finances you can see a lot. And then we will also look at the key business functions and associated core business processes of software vendors. So Previously, we said that we are interested in software startups, which are software vendors, and those companies sell products. They fall into the first categories, category of players in the software industry, which I call standard product providers here, in order to have an umbrella term for both the classic term called independent software vendor and the newer emergence of software as a service providers, sometimes called internet companies. Both provide standardized products. The classic ISVs provide them to customers by way of a license sale, sell, sale so that customers can operate the software on-premise or in their own cloud, while software as a service providers will just host and operate the software for you. You never get to receive a binary of it. That's separate from the consulting firms and the various nonprofits in the software industry. So we will be focusing on standardized product providers, whether that product in its standardized form comes as a binary that you install on your machine or whether it's operated for you. Even if it's operated for you uh, as part of a cloud service, it's still a standardized product that is provided to you. And then we also talked about how these products uh, have basically uh, a life cycle in which they grow and mature, go from core to basic to whole product. Here we will make the assumption that uh, sooner or later uh, we will have a whole product. So there's a key distinction already present in my separation of product providers and consultancies because and this key distinction is how one provide products for a market and the others provide projects to customers where projects are usually one-off individual customized uh, projects as opposed to products again for a market i also in the past pointed out how these how product and projects are complementary in that in order to get the business value out of a standardized commercial of the cell of the shelf software you actually need an implementation project to make it uh, run uh, on premise or for you just customer to customize it so we see that here again on the left you have four you have four examples here on the left is the original software vendor SAP, SugarCM, MethodPak, and Microsoft, and they provide a product, all right, that is a product, a canned standardized uh, thing. And then to put it into action, in the case of the three enterprise software packages, products here, uh, you need a consulting firm which performs a project in which that product is uh, customized and custom tailored and adapted to the customer needs. So there's a gap from the commercial of the shelf, the generic, the vanilla version of the enterprise software and the version of the software as it has been configured and adapted and integrated into the business context of a customer. This second part, again, the projects are usually provided by consulting firms. Sometimes they are also provided by the same, very same company, which provides the original product. So MethodPak is a small, comparatively small company to these others here. 
and it provides both the product stages and then has a professional services uh, part of the company which can also implement the software with, company, with cu customers so that they get the value they were looking for. And uh, this is uh, key to get the value out. In the consumer space, um, for example, if you were to buy Microsoft Office, you do not pay some consultancy to make it fit your machine. Consumers usually expect the software to work out of the box. That is not the case if this example was about an enterprise sale of Microsoft Office uh, to a company, because then most likely you would, would have an implementation, a consulting firm performing an implementation project with the company because even Office needs some embedding in an enterprise context and be it the availability or the hooking up of users through Active Directory services so that users of Office are identified and that the license management performs and so forth. There's a fundamental financial and business difference between projects and products that we need to understand it uh, explains why i'm so intently repeating it um, they have a very different revenue structure so here you see the classic the traditional way of how a company a software vendor makes money of selling their product once in the first year there's usually an initial one-time license fee it could be 10,000 euro, it could be a million euro, it really depends on the product. And now after the product has been put into action with the customer, in the follow-on year, there will only be a maintenance fee, which is around 20% of the initial fee. Sometimes it's 25, sometimes it's 15, it depends. That is a very common pattern. An initial one-time license fee for one year, it covers all the services that are needed and after that the fee drops from the initial license fee to the maintenance fee at about 20% of the original value and the customer is allowed to keep using the software. Comes a major release, new release, uh, the original vendor will often try to upsell the customer and collect another initial one-time license fee which can be uh, a tens time because customers often just want to stick with the old version while the vendor wants them to move on to the new version and if just not to have the maintenance burden of the by now then for them old software so that's the classic way and the nice thing of this product revenue the nice thing with this product revenue is that you don't just sell a license once you sell a second license and a third license and because it's a canned product you can comparatively easy sell more licenses you don't need to hire that much more people now that's the beauty of software which can be copied easily and while there is some correlation with labor most notably on support in general you will try to sell as many licenses as possible so here you can see how it plays out over five years uh, under the simplifying illustration here that there's one more license sale each year. You can see how the initial license revenue is nice, but the real kicker, the real win is the growing base revenue from the maintenance, from the maintenance revenue of the established customers. The assumption is the customers stay around, keep paying the maintenance revenue. Of course, some customers might leave, but uh, here the assumption is they're happy and just stay. And you can see the trajectory. The overall revenue keeps increasing, uh, and as I noted, uh, does not necessarily mean that for each new license sale you need to hire new people. So this is a very nice business to be in. This classic traditional view has been changing, but not fundamentally, but has been changing to uh, let go of the initial license fee uh, and jump straight to a subscription uh, uh, fee. In that case, uh, we just have a flat um, of price, uh, the subscription price for whatever particular version of the software 
uh, you're paying as a customer. So you have you have that flat price and it's the same over here. So no difference in the first year. So yes, you don't get that initial license fee. But um, certainly the hurdle to entry or the barrier to entry for buying is lower. And the subscription service is often a software as a service uh, being provided, which means that in addition to the plain license to use the software, the vendor also operates the software for the customer in their own cloud, which obviously makes it um, a better deal for the customer because now they don't have to, they don't have the operating expenses for operating uh, the software. And hence the actual subscription revenue for one sale is higher than the original maintenance revenue of on-premise software. Um, however, that is not the key part. The key part is that with a subscription-based uh, revenue, like with the traditional initial license fee plus maintenance revenue, uh, because it's a product and if, and if customers stay around, then because it's a product, it just keeps piling up. So you have this growing base revenue that makes your software that makes your product and the company so profitable over over time if you survive so that is different from project businesses because projects um, are one-time events if you will so project is something that you do and it has a defined start and it has a defined end so it's not a project if you if it doesn't have a start or an end uh, then even though people often use the word project in many ways, uh, by definition, there should be a start date and an end date. And then whatever happens in between is work you put in. So, it, so the money you make, the revenue strongly correlate with labor because that's what the customer is typically paying for. They pay for the labor, the services you provide as part of the project. So they're paying for your people. High price if it's highly skilled labor, less of a high price if it's more average commodity type labor, but labor nevertheless. So the time you spend in the project. And uh, that should be familiar to you because you do a lot of projects in your studies and the main ones obviously are your final thesis. Now look at this from the revenue perspective. Software projects uh, bring in some revenue because they are the fees you charge your customer for a project. If you have a set amount of people and you get them all employed on a project, you can get a nice you can get nice revenue for that project. But then the project is over. Let's assume for illustration's sake, it's over after a year. So after a year, there's no further revenue because the project is over and the customer has paid. So then for a consulting company, you acquire a second project and maybe you do well and you uh, fill all, uh, all the people in your company, get to work on it, maybe for the same price. So next year you get the same fees again and third year, third year the same and fourth year the same. So you can see here how because the project ends and that stops any revenue from flowing, you can see how unless you get more people, your revenues will stay the same from year to year. Unlike with the software vendors where revenues will keep creeping up because of the base maintenance or subscription revenue of established existing customers. That base does not exist for project revenues. As you can see it here in comparison, left side, the uh, um, product revenue and how it keeps piling up right side the project revenue one sale and multiple sales are still still the same for that reason uh, for say venture capitalists software product firms software vendors are much more interesting than project firms or consultancies so let's compare those since maybe if you're thinking about a startup you need to understand the difference between these two forms of companies you could uh, found a software vendor uh, who survived and thrives has comparatively predictable revenue because there are the established customers 
and stopping to use a software that is ingrained in their business operations is hard for customers. So they don't lose customers that quickly. There is churn, but you keep tend to keep customers. So there's predictable revenue and uh, that predictable revenue need leads to high value valuation multiples in the stock, stock market. The disadvantage is, as I implied by if you are, if you survived, is that um, it's hard to get started because uh, you do not have that base of customers who feed you. Uh, in the beginning, you have no customers and it takes a while until you actually have a product that you can, can sell. Even if you get to a core product quickly and you are able to reach the early adopters, the innovators who are willing to keep to accept all the flaws of your product even if you make it there you still have to cross the chasm you still have to grow until eventually you're profitable so the time gap from starting out to getting profitable and being able to live off your own revenues that time gap needs needs outside financing which uh, requires investment which means that uh, if you even get it there will be venture capitalists and uh, they will take part in some of the company, some equity in the company, etc. It's compensated by the company possibly being so much more worth, but it's not your company any longer if you take that exclusively, if you take that investment. So it's also highly risky because um, it is hard to make it to profitability. So many fail. Consulting firms, on the other hand, are not capital intensive. It's you and your friends. And so you can start out easily if you can sell your time. So um, you have a number of people, you have time at your hands and you sell that time. Pricing is simple. Finding customers is comparatively simple, at least today in the IT industry. You just sell your time. But again, after you sold your time, time's over, there's no new money coming in. So revenue uh, means you need to not, you, you're always looking uh, and living for the next project to bring in the next revenue to live off and it's not necessarily growing. Sales gets easier once you're established and but still your revenue stays flat unless you hire more people. Often that actually also means higher volatility of the business because you're moving at twice the frequency of the rest of the economy. If uh, everything's doing uh, great, then you're in high demand. And if uh, because people want to take an IT industry, want to use you for taking advantage of chances, opportunities in the market. But uh, then if everything's really, really bad, uh, you're still being paid because now you're introduced and your services are needed to help the company cut cost, replace people with software and so forth. Now, um, do you get venture capital? Usually not. There is no recognizable return on investment like with the software vendors. So consulting firms, you can start them by yourself. You will remain in the driver's seat. It's your company. Uh, but scaling is in some sense even harder uh, uh, than with a vendor because you need to find good people. And well, it's its own skill. So with that, um, let's take a look at the finances of software vendors. Um, we will focus on software vendors because that's where the startups are, the venture capital funded startups. Um, some of you may know that, for many it may be new if you don't have an economics background. There are three main statements uh, by which you account for your finances. There's the balance sheet, the income statement, and the cash flow statement. The balance sheet is certainly important, but to understand a business uh, less so because that's an absolute view of your assets and liabilities and so forth. And so it doesn't tell you much what happened from year to year. Most people will look at for a for an, uh, stable, mature company and how it's doing will look at the income statement because that shows the revenues of a given year and the costs of a given the expenses of a given year and whether there's some profit uh, left at the end and there is uh, and then there's the cash flow statement 
which is really only relevant if you're near. Okay. <laughs> I, I hope financial accountants will forgive me if I simplify so much, but the cash flow statements are mostly important if you're running out of money and really need to look at the actual uh, accounts uh, rather than what happens at year end and so forth. So we will be looking at the income statement because that's you can how you where you can see the dynamics, the finances in a well working uh, software vendor company. So far, I used the terms hoping that you would kind of divine or understand what I'm talking about. Revenues, that is the money that you make from customers. It's the money that comes in, therefore also income often and sometimes even sales. So that's the same revenues, income and sales. That's usually the same term, the money that comes in from the customers. Then you have costs, which are called expenses. So it's revenues and expenses or income and costs. And the costs are, well, uh, your labor, for example, your people, but also operating hardware or the office building and what have you. Revenues are different from profit because profit is the difference between revenues and expenses. So what's left after you paid everyone and paid everything that needed paying the expenses uh, out of your revenues. So um, you have a profit, meaning a positive value resulting from subtracting expenses from revenues if you obviously make more money than you spend and you have a loss if you spend more money uh, than you take in. As a software startup, before you break even, you're operating at a loss, you're continuously losing money and that's why you need the outside investment for. Then eventually you break even, you cross over from producing losses to profitability, having a profit, and then you don't need any um, any outside investment anymore. And it's actually the choice of the company whether it wants to uh, break even sooner or later. And it's not that everyone wants to be profitable right away, as we will see. And the reason for that is that if the market opportunity is there, maybe you want to raise more and more venture capital to grow, even though you could already be profitable you don't want to be profitable because you want to use your income and invest it and get outside investment so that you're getting more and more market share. It's basically a play that you expect to see an even higher return on investment in the future. You typically only turn to profitability if you think that there is uh, no new ground in the market. And now it's uh, fighting with others over market share and not everything's open up for grabs yet any longer. All right, so here is an income statement of Facebook uh, of all. And so that's a software as a service company sells your data and your attention, uh, dear students, to advertisers. And while a bit older, it's still very informative. So at the top, you can see revenues so um, uh, Facebook has re had revenues in 2011 from uh, of 1.6 billion US dollar. And most of it almost exclusively is from subscription and support. So that's the advertising function and what have you. There's a little bit from professional services, uh, uh, less than 1%, uh, less than 10%, and uh, um, so maybe 7-8%. So it is relevant, but it's the smaller, smaller, much smaller part. Revenues are complemented here in this simplified income statement with the costs. So that's the expenses or costs. And you can see how there's a direct matching subscription and support. Net income uh, had, had revenues of 1.5 billion, but uh, the cost for providing it, the direct cost of providing it was only 200 million. Professional services had, uh, had uh, a revenue of 100 million and had expenses of 100 million. So they didn't even make money off that. Obviously, subscription and support is the breadwinner here. And professional services exist to satisfy customers, meaning in this case, they didn't even make much money off professional services. Uh, enterprise software companies often have a professional service arm 
as mentioned, when they start out small, there may be no partner, no consultancy that's willing to serve uh, as a professional service firm or a consulting firm for the vendor. So they have to do it themselves. But even as they grow, as they get, get larger, and there are actually consultancies who are performing these implementation, this consulting and implementation projects for or together with the vendor, um, even then, the vendors will often want to keep some professional service uh, organizational unit in order to stay close to the customers. It is a good way to understand how customers are using your product, what works, what doesn't. Product managers like talking to professional services because that's where the rubber hits the ground and the folks in professional services see how well the product is working or not. And that's critical information for the roadmap of the product for its future. So you can see here revenues minus cost of revenues, um, the direct expenses, that's the gross profit. And that is pretty, pretty nice here. There are further expenses, uh, which are the kind of fixed expenses based on existing uh, labor uh, in the company mostly. So all the people and what do they cost? Because it's not a consultancy, it does not correlate directly with revenues, the consultancy part that was the professional services part. So the operating expenses here, the stable fixed, exp uh, fixed uh, cost is, for example, research and development. That's the engineers. And it is interesting to see how of uh, the operating expenses at 100%, um, research and development is 11% of that. Sales and marketing is half of the operating expenses. Looks or appears the sales and marketing folks in total at least are making significantly more money than the engineers. Then there's general administrative. These are um, office admins and other, other um, folks. So you can see that's actually common. Research and development is more like 15%, I'd argue, in other companies, 15% uh, of the operating expenses. But yes, sales and marketing has a much higher cost bucket uh, than, than engineering. So here's a nice exercise that Thomas uh, brought to this lecture. Uh, let's compare Accenture and Salesforce. Accenture is a, a large consultancy, the original Anderson Consulting, which does all kinds of uh, IT projects. So it's a project firm, consultancy. And Salesforce, of course, is a software as a service a firm or a cloud service uh, firm. And the nice thing about Accenture is that unlike most other consultancies, which are not traded in the public markets, uh, Accenture is actually publicly traded. So we can look at what uh, the world or the stock market thinks Accenture is worth. You don't see it here. Uh, there are two question marks. The overall value in the stock market for Accenture and Salesforce, we'll see that in a bit. Uh, but this data is available. Uh, then there is, uh, you can see the revenue, so you might make a guess. <laughs> you can see how Accenture has revenues of 43 billion, while Salesforce has revenues of uh, 17 billion, so more than twice uh, revenue with Accenture. Uh, the income, the net income, so basically after subtracting uh, basically profits, after subtracting all, all expenses and taxes and depreciation is still 4.5 billion for Accenture, while Salesforce, it's not zero, but um, is com comparatively low at 100 million, in <laughs> relatively speaking low. <laughs> and then you have uh, the way how the stock market looks at it, but I, it's also uh, um, with question marks here only, uh, the price to sales ratio is basically uh, expectation about future revenues and future profitability of these companies. So ultimately, which one's more expensive? So that's the absolute value, the market capitalization, but then the price to sales ratio uh, tells you more about the uh, expectations because um, the revenues um, of 
of uh, sales force are much lower than Accenture's. And then you can see um, here's a first giveaway, gross profit margin. Accenture has, um, uh, after subtracting the uh, cost of revenues from revenues, it has a gross profit margin of 30%, uh, while Salesforce is, is much higher of 74%. But when, once you look again at uh, net income or then net profit margin, you can see that Accenture seems nicer, while um, Salesforce 0.74%, uh, not so much. But revenue growth again is growing. So what does that tell us? Think about it for a second. Oh yeah, sure, look at employees. Um, so Accenture is uh, 10 times larger by employee count than Salesforce. And what does that tell us? So once you've thought about it, have you? Ding, 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 one, two, three. Accenture is much more mature and hence um, people have less expectations about growth than with Salesforce, which is uh, still growing and that's why, for example, the net income uh, is comparatively low. All of the money gets reinvested. Salesforce does not want to bank money as profits. It wants to put the money to work. And so you can see some of this here. You can see how the market capitalization, meaning what it would take to buy the whole company in the stock market, at least theoretically, is about the same. Um, uh, Accenture, of course, still has that much higher revenue, um, but it is selling at a much lower uh, uh, price to sales ratio, which means that the stock market expects much lower growth of the company than for Salesforce, which also means that if you buy shares now, then uh, you will not get the same return that you that people are expecting of Salesforce. And uh, that really simply shows that uh, on the one hand, project firm, this particular project firm is more mature or as interpreted here as well, the growth is just not and cannot be so significant as for example, as the Salesforce, because uh, the scalability is still in the people. And when you look at the large number of people uh, they have more than 10 times those of Salesforce. Keeping scaling those is so much harder than selling more licenses or subscriptions and uh, buttressing this, this with a few more people that the market really says, whoops, Salesforce is worth more and we expect it to be worth even more in the future. That's again why the software vendors are dominating the high end of the stock market as I pointed out in the very first lecture of this uh, course on the software industry. Consultancies are fine businesses, the real, really rocket uh, com rockets, companies as a rocket are the software vendors and um, Salesforce is one of them. So with that, let's turn towards the inner workings of, uh, of a software vendor. There are a couple of key business functions we need to understand and that every company needs to execute well or not be as successful as they possibly could be. Obviously, you need to be good at building a quality product or at least a product that meets the expectations has good enough quality. You need to be good at acquiring customers, selling your product operating your product if it's in the cloud, supporting customers uh, and what I call ensuring satisfaction here, so-called customer success. So you can see how by org unit, different organizational units of the vendor are in play. Uh, at the top, you can see a rough structure of how a software vendor might have different departments, sales and marketing, is one, engineering is another one. These are usually the, the two key departments. In sales and marketing, sales and marketing are typically uh, separate and you often have 
a customer success function, which are those people who, after the sale happened, are tasked with making sure that the customers actually realize the business value you promised them. Uh, good companies don't leave their customers alone, bumbling along and not knowing how to use the product and how to get the value out of it. You don't want you want them to come back and pay next year again. So you need to make sure that your customers actually get the value out of your product or you will lose them. Engineering, of course, is the actual development and possibly uh, operations. Um, and engineering works closely with product management, the third key function here, because product management, that's those people who are supposed or who do understand the customer needs, uh, where customers are markets and market segments and not individual customers. And so for building the product, product management works with engineering. Sales then is uh, cross-functional from sales and marketing and product management. Um, sales uh, often needs to know where the product is headed. So that's why they talk to product management. They need the roadmap. While product management learns a lot or can learn a lot about customer needs through sales and marketing. S with that said, it's often a difficult relationship because sales will want to sell a lot of different things that may not be in the product but promise will soon be in the product so dear customer please sign now and of course product management has to push back because product management is concerned of with meeting the market needs and not an individual customer's need so all the funny extensions that various customers want and even if it's just the peculiarity of the customer CEO um, the product manager very critically needs to look at this and ask will this be a one-time thing or will it be something that helps us sell more products engineering definitely hates it building funny one-off things that only one customer wants and that they have to maintain and ver under version control and that they don't want in the general product often. So the operations of the product, if it's a cloud service, that's development or operations and support. So you need to support the, the product and uh, certainly operations needs to work with development to make sure that there is adequate software for properly operating the product. And if not, it would be poor operations. Supporting customers, that's why you have a support department, often in engineering, but they also talk to product management because the other place where the proverbial something hits the fan is when customers call why things are and tell you about things that are not working. So customer support is also where a product manager can learn well what, what works and what doesn't about the product. And then, as I mentioned, customer success needs to work with uh, customers, with professional services and product management to make sure um, to make sure that the customers get the value out of the product. There was a very quick run through the various functions, so let me be a bit more elaborate here. Um, product management, perhaps at least in my book, is the most critical of all the business functions. Of course, you need all of them, but I would argue that um, most of your character traits, if this was a game, your points should be spent on product management um, because these are the folks who need to make sure that whatever you're doing meets market demand and there's no value in developing a beautiful product that is bug free if nobody cares. So making sure that you meet market demand by way of features laid out in a roadmap, that's what product management does. Sometimes there is a, a chief product officer, that's the title, or just VP of product. And often you distinguish between more strategic product managers and um, technical product managers. Technical product managers are often mapped to scrum product owners, taking care of the nitty gritty of technical details that need implementation. So strategic product managers identify 
new business opportunities justify why resources should be spent on that and uh, define uh, a product vision and a roadmap. And technical product managers take that roadmap, take the vision and turn it into features. Uh, again, if it was Scrum, into a product bag. So um, they are, have key stakes in building the right product, uh, but they also need to talk with sales. The roadmap is important for customer acquisition and certainly they want happy customers like everyone. Engineering then uh, is typically led by an engineering manager, a vice president of engineering, and they are taking the requirements they get from product management and design and build and evolve the actual product. They also sometimes provide third level support. So the highest level of support that you can sell to customers should there be something wrong because now it's the developers and they are the only ones who can deal with serious bugs in the software. So they build, build the product. Again, there's an engineering manager who leads all of it, a VP of engineering, and then there are developers and architects and so forth. Uh, sometimes, at least in Germany, uh, the term used is actually CTO, Chief Technology Officer. That is a real problem, in my opinion, with Germany because CTOs, say in the US, do not denote an engineering manager as much as they denote a technical person, a chief architect. So CTO uh, in the US usually means some sort of chief architect, oversight of architecture, platform, technology choices, what have you, but not so much people responsibility. They may have a staff, but they don't have the whole line organization that is behind a VP of engineering. So you have these two different choice jobs, VP of engineering, who runs the all development, and CTO who's responsible for the architecture, software quality, etc. And in Germany, this often gets conflated. So the CTO in Germany in a startup is often both the VP of engineering and the chief architect, uh, which is in my book problematic. There's operations in particular, well, obviously if you're a cloud service, so you have these new job titles of the site reliability engineer and operations manager who keep the cloud running, who keep the product running. So they operate it and they may also provide third level support and so forth. Support, oh, that's the support engineers and their managers respond to customer requests, uh, probably work on automating some of that as well in order to lighten their own load. And uh, yeah, Marketing on the other side, uh, that's the marketeers and the marketing managers. Their job is to create product and brand awareness and generate a demand. And we'll see in a bit, there's something called the sales funnel, the process by which you acquire customers. And they need to stuff that sales funnel with leads. So leads are companies, potential customers in the very early stages when they are just a blip on the radar screen that they might become customers in the future. So they generate these leads again by creating awareness, by making the product known through campaigns, webinars, uh, showing up at fairs, etc. Sometimes they also look at competitors and provide the product manager with competitive intelligence. So next to marketing, there's of course sales. So there are salespeople. Uh, that's its own complex uh, operation. So you have the direct sales rep. You sometimes have pre-sales people who prepare the ground. You have sales managers, territory managers, and so forth, account managers. Uh, account manager, that's the term companies use if you have vendors use if you have a big customer which means uh, they are the account where the money comes in with the vendor and you and it's such a big product that you can sell them incrementally more modules more functionality and so you often make individual people in the vendors sales organization responsible for managing the account making sure that nothing goes wrong with the CEO of that customer company who, which brings in so much money. And they might at times be very protective of any, say, product manager's request to ask that one company about 
things going on with the product. So uh, in larger vendors, sales managers often are responsible then for particular customers, not just territories or so, and then they are account managers. So the sales function or sales people take over from marketing, which generates the leads. Sales people turn the qualified leads into customers. That's the core sales process uh, of making someone an initial customer. And then there are all kinds of other sales opportunities and upsell, meaning selling more functionality, cross sell, selling related products if you are a multi product vendor and so forth. The aforementioned customer success um, plays the role of uh, the customer on the one hand uh, towards its own organization, but uh, that is at least what you would tell customers. Of course, their goal is to make sure that customers are happy, but of course they work for the, uh, for the company, for the vendor itself. So they ensure actual use. It happens so often that companies buy a product and then it doesn't get used. And if that is recognized by the customer, then there will be no renewal. There will be no maintenance or subs continued subscription fee. And professional services, again, are the consultants, the project managers who run these consulting projects, implementation projects to get the product to fly, uh, get it to work with the customer. So they are, that's why they also deal with the solution, right? There's the product, which is the software, the commercial of the soft shelf software itself, but it needs to be turned into a solution that solves customer problems, business problems. There are lots of other functions. So um, human resources shouldn't get short thrift here because uh, increasingly it's been recognized or it has been by some companies recognized for a long time how important HR is because uh, who makes uh, what makes a company tick? Well, the people. So hiring the right people, hiring quality is really important. And uh, that is hard in particular in the IT industry with huge amount of competition uh, for talent. So HR is not a lowly support function, hasn't been for a long time. It's really critical to company success and it needs to understand the business. It needs uh, to help, needs to know how and where to find the right people, how to assess them and help the hiring managers, usually someone from the business line function, uh, make the right decisions. They also have lots of compliance um, uh, tasks, etc. But that's the more classic HR. Finance, that depends on where you are. There are very different financial tasks. Of course, if you're a startup, uh, fundraising is important, though that's often done by the CEO. But if you're a much larger company, there are other ways of, fi of fi financing yourself. You can even get a loan or so, and that's more a traditional finance function then. Here is another contribution by Thomas, the org chart of what used to be called the tabulating machine company uh, these days, that's IBM. And you can see how 100 years ago, uh, 1917, the idea of company structure was a strict hierarchical breakdown. You can see the tree structure here. Now, you still need, or I recommend you understand the business functions and the organizational structure of software vendors because, dear students, that's your career prospects. So let's assume you're either a business student or an engineering student, as we commonly have in our classes. So you are starting out, so you're shown here at the bottom, and you can choose to join different organizational units, different parts of the company. As a business student, the two obvious choices are sales and marketing, and the entry level positions are sales rep and marketing manager, interestingly enough, or marketeer perhaps. You can also start out as a product manager if you have sufficient product and application domain affinity. 
it's actually really hard if it's technical products and you don't have a technical background. That's why product management positions are often filled by engineering students because they have the required technical understanding uh, and it is in general, uh, general easier to pick up business knowledge on the side than is to develop an intuition for technology. So engineering students also feed into product management, but mostly they become developers in their entry level job. Well, maybe called junior developers then. And then you can have a career. So um, sales reps can become sales managers, can become VP of sales. There's a fair change in capabilities. Being a sales rep is very different from managing salespeople. Being a marketeer or marketing person, you can advance to be a marketing manager or CMO then eventually. Product managers can become strategic product managers. Usually the strategic product managers have a higher reputation than the technical product managers and they are much less. And of course, eventually you could become the CPO, the chief product officer. In engineering, um, the developer can either choose to uh, go the uh, managerial route, then they could become an engineering manager and eventually the VP, the vice president of engineering, or they could go the domain or the technical route, become a software senior software developer, software architect, and eventually CTO in the more narrow American sense and not in the broad German sense. So these are your the typical titles, uh, uh, the rough career prospect that you might be facing. So I just talked about the organizational structure of uh, companies, There's still a fair bit of hierarchy, and the roles or the positions that uh, people take within those structure, the different business functions tied to the job titles. And I also early on talked a little bit about the business processes, So, but I would like now to look a little bit more at those and how they interact. So for one, uh, we need to understand very clearly within a company, certainly from your career perspective, which parts of the company are so-called profit centers and which are cost centers. The difference is that profit centers are supposed to make uh, money. And so they are where, uh, where the reason is why the company exists. So that's the um, engineering department for a software vendor. And that's the uh, salespeople usually. And cost centers are those parts of the company which don't bring in money. There's no revenue recognizably assignable to them, even though you sometimes want a breakdown of share and based on their contribution. And that's very often actually finance and HR. And, uh, but you need them. So um, this classic profit center, cost center distinction is not always fair and maybe not always right. But as general advice, naturally you want to work in a profit center because if your activity can be more closely tied to how the company makes money, maybe you have a safer job than if it's not so directly obvious how your contribution to the company um, uh, um, helps it make money uh, and rather you appear as a cost center or you are a cost center and you only uh, cost money. So again, here's the organizational structure. I think we've seen this in various forms now. I pulled out the titles. So you can see at the bottom the different org units and on top of that the posts, the people who lead them and how they are sometimes uh, grouped. What's noteworthy is that the org units are led by vice presidents, obvious or often. And then across multiple key org units, you have a C-level uh, of, say, chief revenue officer. That would be the CRO who brings in the money. And the CTO, interestingly enough, who often is above the VP of engineering and the VP of product management. It's questionable whether that's good. And it's also often that the functions associated with these posts are much more distributed than you would think. Certainly in a startup, a CEO 
is often heavily involved in say sales or product management depends on the person and so forth as mentioned uh, the so traditionally a cfo because finances is so important a cfo the chief finance officer is a c-level position but also human resources now is a um, is a c-level position after eventually companies realize the significance of the quality of their people to a company's success. And the core business processes are those uh, listed early on. So building a product, acquiring customers, operating the service, supporting customers and ensuring that they are happy and come back. Product development, that's product management and development, that's the key and so we are not covering this in this course because that could be agile development plus strategic product management and that's the product manager and the engineering manager and the technical product manager product owner and the software developers doing their job now more interesting from a business perspective is perhaps here customer acquisition the sales process so as I mentioned um, the sales process is usually conceptualized by way of the so-called sales funnel that is a set of stages uh, which customer so which companies that could be customers are led along and you can see it here in this colorful funnel in the middle customers as so companies who are not yet customers have to be made aware of your product if they don't know anything about it they are certainly not going to become customers then they need to discover more information about it um, if they are then interested they want to evaluate the product whether it has value for them which hopefully for the vendor turns into intent to buy which is still separate from the final actual buy step because it could be too expensive and as you can see by the allocation here the first two stages in the simplified uh, sales funnel uh, awareness and discovery that's the task of the marketing department they fill the pipeline they generate the leads uh, lead being the term for the companies in the funnel and then at some point of time sales people sales reps take over um, and try to get the uh, potential customer to become a real customer along the lines so product management sometimes plays in but really key is marketing management and sales operations well that is again development which does the development of the relevant features and operations who watches over the operations of the web service the operators or administrators and now with all the cloud businesses we have site reliability engineers in between um, engineering and operations they don't usually do new novel business value generating function functions what they do is they make sure the software runs reliably and so they focus on the technical uh, domain of making the software run well making it possible that the software scales etc customer support those are the folks again who uh, have to pick up the phone uh, their work is being sell, sold uh, so they actually generate revenue eventually and so they are available for customers to answer their questions on the levels mentioned one first level third second level third level and so forth they interact with product management because product managers want to know what's wrong with the product and support knows because that's the th same thing that customers ask over and over again why how do i do this and why doesn't that work finally customer uh, success is uh, um, how to make sure that customers use the software use it right get the value so that they renew and that's it for me today or for the session at least we talked about products and uh, the vendors producing products the key distinction between projects and product firms or consultancy and software vendors and why it's so much nicer financially if you survive to be a software vendor rather than a consultancy. We looked at the financial view and how you can recognize in the income statement how a company operates and what its prospects are and then 
We looked at the various business functions and associated core processes. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in the next session. Bye bye until then.